welcome everyone um, to the webinar on C++ in 2020. Um, so those of you who don't know us, um, my name's Dan Payton uh, and I'm an account manager here at Grey Matter. Um, for those of you who've not heard of Grey Matter before, uh, we're a software reseller and cloud services provider. Um, we've uh, been in the industry since 1983 and we were started by a developer in a small quaint town of Ashburton in Devon. Uh, we've been supporting developers and independent software vendors with their project for many years now. Uh, we've therefore got a pretty good understanding of your needs and requirements. Uh, we're proud to work with over 400 partners covering a wide range of business, technical uh, and development areas. Uh, today we're joined by three of our partners. Uh, we've got Cedric from Intel, who's going to be presenting on next generation cross architecture C++ development. Uh, Anastasia and Phil from JetBrains, who are going to run through some really interesting findings from their developer ecosystem survey and provide some demos. And we've got Mary and Chris from Whole Tomato Software, who will share some trends they've seen and demo Visual Assist. After each session, there's going to be some time to answer a couple of questions. Uh, please post these questions in the question bar, uh, and we're going to go through any final questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so I think uh, we're going to pass over to Cedric. Thank you. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Cedric Andreoli. I'm a technical consulting engineer at Intel. So basically, I'm working on, on the tools, mainly compiler, uh, advisor, Vtune. And uh, I'm doing the bridge between the people using uh, those tools and the people developing those tools at, at Intel. And uh, today the presentation here is about uh, Data Parallel C++, uh, which is um, at some point some kind of new language that we are introducing uh, to target different devices. Uh, so yeah, that's basically the the goal of this introduction. I will show you some examples and then later if you have questions feel free to, to ask. So here is uh, the agenda. So uh, we are going to start with what is this uh, DPC++. I will show you uh, Hello World. Uh, I will also give you some heads up about compilation and execution flow. So how does it work on, on multiple devices? And then finally, I will also introduce uh, one of the key feature of uh, DPC++, which is the unified shared memory. So let's start. So what is this uh, DPC++? You probably have heard about it. Uh, we already presented um, one API uh, in London um, earlier, uh, and so that was face-to-face, -face. but here is basically a summary. So um, DPC++, uh, this is based on C++, so that's just some kind of standard C++. Uh, we are uh, also on the top of SQL, uh, which is a standard developed by the Kronos Group. Uh, the one also um, at the starting point of OpenCL. And uh, on the top of SQL, we are adding um, many features. Uh, the main goal here is uh, to be able to simplify a lot um, the syntax of SQL, which uh, requires to write a lot of lines of code in, in some senses. So here, the, the main addition of um, DPC++ uh, is uh, to be able to simplify this uh, this uh, standard. We are also um, adding something called unified shared memory, so USM. Uh, you will get more details about that later. We are also adding some features such as uh, ND range uh, decomposition into subgroups, uh, ordered queues, and things like that. Uh, so I, I will describe some of those features uh, in this presentation. So uh, on the implementation side, um, what we need to be able to, uh, to use this uh, DPC++ is uh, obviously a compiler. So our compiler is based on Clang plus LLVM. Uh, and we also provide a runtime uh, that will allow you to uh, target different devices. So everything is available if you want more details on a GitHub page. So you will get the slides. So you don't need to try to print the screen or whatever. You will get the slides and then you can uh, go to those uh, pages if you want uh, even more details. So hello world example. 
So before we dig into the code, I'm just showing you this slide uh, to um, introduce some of the simplification that we are doing. So again, we want to make this uh, language a bit simpler. So um, that's the kind of uh, header file that we are usually uh, using in our presentations and also in our samples. So uh, we define uh, the namespace SQL to avoid typing it every time. And we also define uh, some way to access the data uh, and I will uh, describe that later, but uh, we have basically three defines here. Uh, dpc underscore r for um, the read access mode, uh, dpc underscore w for the write, and dpc underscore rw for uh, both read and write. And there is also something else that is um, that we are using by default here. Uh, it's an option when we are using our compiler, we are using the minus f sql and name lambda option. Uh, so this is a default behavior of the compiler starting beta 0.4. But if you are using a earlier version of um, one API, then you will have to add this to the command line if you want to compile the snippet of codes that we are presenting here. And I will also explain uh, why we are using this. So the hello world. So that's not actually exactly a hello world. It's a vector vector addition. Uh, but uh, that's simple enough to uh, explain some of the concepts of uh, SQL and DPC++ here. So how does it work? We have uh, three different sections in this code. So I'm just showing uh, two different sections here, which are uh, the host code. So we have uh, basically a part of the code that is going to be executed on the host, which is um, in this case, the CPU. Uh, and we have also another part of the code uh, that uh, can be executed on a device and the device can be a different kind of device like the CPU, uh, GPU, FPGA, whatever uh, is available in the runtime basically. Uh, so the host code uh, is only executed on the host uh, and um, what you can see here we have some array declarations, we have some buffer declaration uh, and again we are going to um, describe that step by step. And at the end uh, of this uh, example, we are printing back uh, the C array uh, with the results of the vector addition of A and B. And the part in the middle here, this is the code that runs on the device. So that's basically our kernel. And that's what is doing the addition of A and B and putting the result into C. So just before I explain this code, um, I'm just going on the, the platform model side uh, to explain just a bit how we separate the device and the host. So we have those two different uh, platforms at some point. So the host is the CPU and uh, we have access to the host memory. So um, the, the RAM basically where most of the allocations are done. If you are reading input files, this is usually where you store the data. And then we have the device, uh, which can be a GPU, FPGA. It can also be the CPU, actually. Uh, and the uh, device uh, is uh, designed um, across what we call compute units. So compute units is basically uh, what is going to uh, do the operations. On the application side, uh, I told you uh, on the previous slide, we have the host code and the device code. So the host code is uh, obviously executed on the host device, so on the CPU. And the device code is uh, split into uh, what we call common groups. And those common groups are basically synchronization commands, data movement operations, and also the user defined kernel. So that's where you define your operation, what you want to do on the GPU at some point. So once you create those command groups, uh, we are going to create, uh, so the, the runtime is going to send those command groups to uh, a common queue that is going to be in charge of executing uh, on the device. And on the device, you have different uh, memories. So you have the private memory, which is private to a single compute unit. You have uh, also the local memory, and depending on the device, you have uh, the global or constant memory. 
and uh, the way it works depends actually on the device, on the, the hardware design. So let's go back to the Hello World. So the first line, we are just declaring uh, three different arrays with 1024 elements, so A, B, and C. And then uh, the, the first step we are doing to, to make those data available on the device is to create buffers. So the buffer creation um, in SQL, uh, not necessarily in DPC++, and you will understand later, but in SQL, this is usually the first step you are doing. So you are creating those buffers to um, basically map the data between the host and the device. So what you need to understand is that uh, when you create those buffers, the ownership of the data uh, is not to A, B, and C anymore. The ownership of the data belongs to the buffers here, meaning that uh, as long as those buffers are alive, if you try to modify those variables, those arrays, uh, and, and like putting a value directly in A, B, or C, um, that will most probably not work. So you need to be aware of that. And the way we are declaring buffers um, in uh, the SQL standard is uh, the following. So you need to define the type, you need to define the dimension, uh, and then um, in the buffer parameters, you just provide your uh, initial pointer, the pointer to the, the original data, and you provide the range, which is the number of elements that you have uh, in those arrays. And you see that we are specifying here a range of one, which means basically that this is 1D arrays. So it's also possible to specify it for two or 3D arrays. So that's uh, the first step that we are doing here. So the next step is to create the queue. So the queue is uh, attached to a given device. Uh, and uh, by default, um, it goes to the device with um, the more compute power at some point. So you can specify it if you want. Uh, you can also control it through vari environment variables. Here, uh, we are not specifying anything. We are just declaring uh, a queue, a standard queue, which means that we'll let the runtime decide where to affect it. And then we create, we call the submit function, uh, which is going to be the place where we define uh, the commands that will uh, be executed on the device. So then the next step is to create accessors. So the accessors, uh, you can actually um, think about it as uh, the buffer is uh, the equivalent of um, STL containers. And the accessor is kind of the equivalent to uh, STL iterators. So here we specify a way to access the data in the uh, kernel and we uh, create um, so accessors A, B, and C based on the buffers. And we specify if we want to read the data or write the data. And you can also specify uh, read and write. And this is where we are using um, the DPC underscore RW or RW that we defined in the header file. So that's just a way to specify how we are going to access the data. Then the next step is to create the kernel. So what is going to execute the operation? So here the vector vector addition. So for that, we are using the handler that we get from the queue. We are calling the parallel for function. We are defining the range, so the number of iteration. Uh, and we are defining a lambda function. And this lambda function is basically what is going to be executed to run your kernel. And this lambda function takes here a parameter uh, which has uh, the type id uh, and which um, the runtime will populate to give you uh, the correct iteration number. So that's pretty much automatic. You don't have to think too much about the implementation at, at some point. So I mentioned um, earlier that we are using an option when we compile which is minus f sql unnamed lambda. So if you are using sql actually, uh, you need to uh, name your lambda. So you need to put this class something so you can 
put any name here, it's not uh, really a problem, but you need to define the Lambda, otherwise it will not compile with SQL. Uh, so that's one of the things that the PC++ um, wanted to remove, uh, one of the constraints actually, to make the language a little bit simpler. And so by default, if you are using a compiler um, after and starting from beta 04, actually you don't need to, to use this option explicitly, but that's uh, implicit. And you don't need to use this uh, naming convention for the Lambda. So you can basically remove it, which makes the code a little bit simpler. So then I told you we defined uh, uh, iteration space, so the range. So this is one D array and we have 1024 elements in the array. And then we just uh, provide a way to get uh, the correct index. And this is uh, basically provided by the runtime here. So just some vocabulary uh, before we continue here, uh, how DPC++ works. Uh, so basically we have uh, different ways to um, specify the iteration space. So I showed you uh, in the, the example here, we are using range. Range is a way to define uh, the overall uh, iteration space. And then you let basically the runtime decide how this is going to be splitted and how the parallelism is going to be uh, at some point um, sent to the compute units. But you can also do it with much more control by using ND range. And ND range is a way to uh, separate your iteration space into work groups. So there will be examples later on, on, on that. Uh, and it's also possible to separate work groups into subgroups. So that has some interest, for example, for vectorization. And then at the end, uh, a single element here is just what we call a, a work item. So you can find some parallels with CUDA, OpenCL, and SQL here. And for um, the parallelism, so we have uh, different ways to express the parallelism. Uh, we can use tasks. Uh, in that case, uh, the kernel function is just going to be executed once uh, on a single work item. We can use uh, parallel four with range. Uh, so that's the second uh, example here. So it means that you just specify here uh, the whole iteration space and you, you just let the runtime decide how to split it. Uh, then you also have uh, the ability to specify the ND range. So what I showed you on the, on the previous slide where uh, you specify the whole iteration space, but you also specify smaller chunks, which are the, those work groups here. So in this example, so the third example here, uh, the whole iteration space is 1024 um, on each dimension. And we have 16 elements uh, on each dimension in the work group. And then you have other ways to, to do kind of the equivalent, but, but with different syntax. So the two last examples are um, kind of equivalent, uh, so we have different parameters here, but uh, you can do pretty much the same thing as the third one, uh, but with a syntax that is a little bit simpler. So you can specify uh, directly the work group size, uh, and you can also specify uh, the parallel work for work item. So that's different flavors uh, to simplify a little bit the syntax here. But that's really based on the ND range uh, decomposition. And at the end, uh, you can actually uh, just read uh, C. Uh, and what you need to be careful, so I don't know if I can take a pen or something, yeah. Um, so here we are using uh, the C array here. And this C array was declared here. But I told you that once we declare the buffer, uh, you are not expecting to get any interesting things out of those arrays. So you need to be careful. And actually what we are doing here is that we are defining a scope for the buffers. So the scope starts here and the scope ends here, which means that when we reach this point here, the buffers will be uh, destroyed. And then you can get back your access to uh, the original arrays. So that's the reason why we can uh, read data on the host directly in C at the end here.
So how does it work now for selecting the device? Uh, because uh, that's one of the key aspects to be able to uh, and to be sure that you are executing your code on the correct device. So there are different flavors here as well. So the first one is to uh, just declare a queue without any parameters. And in that case, uh, that will use the default selector. And the default selector is explained here. So the default selector, selector by default, what it does, uh, the runtime is going to score all your devices based on the compute power. And um, by default, so this default selector will give you the one with the highest score. Uh, but it's also possible to control it. So if you don't want to, and if you are not sure that you want to always execute, for example, on the GPU or on the CPU, and you want to change and, and, and see how it reflects the performance at runtime, in that case, you can use an environment variable, which is SQL device type. And then you specify here if you want to execute the code on the GPU, on the CPU, or on the host. Uh, and you also have uh, the ability to put this uh, directly in the code. And this is explained here. So you can specify directly in the code. If you know that a given uh, kernel always needs to be executed on the GPU, then you uh, create your queue and you uh, provide as a parameter uh, a GPU selector. Uh, so you can do a GPU selector, accelerator selector for FPGA, CPU selector, or host selector. So just to give you uh, some uh, highlight here. Uh, what is basically the difference so far with CPU selector and host selector? So you might think that this is the same thing as uh, in, in both cases that will be executed by the CPU. So the difference is actually in the implementation. So um, if I recall our implementation, um, I, I'm not sure it's still the case, but there are still differences anyway. But in the first place, the CPU selector was implemented with TBB, so threading building blocks. Uh, and uh, the host selector was implemented with OpenCL. So um, in the previous versions of uh, one API, CPU selector was usually faster than host selector. So here, this is an example where we specify the GPU selector directly into the code here. So that's pretty straightforward um, and, and pretty actually easy to control. So there is also something else that uh, came up, um, I think with beta 05. Um, so that's the ability to use C++ uh, 17 uh, standard to write the code. And uh, you need to specify this option when you compile. And then you can simplify uh, a little bit your code by declaring the buffer uh, that way here. So you don't need to uh, use the range anymore, specify the dimension, the number of elements. You just create your buffers by um, pointing to the original pointer. And then the runtime will be able to detect the size and, and, and whatever the dimensions and, uh, and do it for you. So that makes the code a little bit more readable here. So I don't know on the chat if there are questions so far. I can probably just quickly open it. No question. Okay, perfect. So compilation and uh, execution now. So how does it work? So basically you have your C++ file with your uh, DPC++ code or SQL code inside it. Uh, so you compile it with the DPC++ compiler. So that will generate um, mainly two different kinds of things. So first, standard object files. So very similar to what you have with any kind of compiler, but it will also generate some uh, intermediate representation for the kernels. So the kernels are not completely compiled, they are just in an intermediate representation form, uh, which um, allows you actually to run it on different uh, devices as long as you have the driver in your runtime later. Uh, then everything is linked and that creates uh, the executable. So now you take your uh, binary, you start uh, executing it, and uh, basically what it's going to do, the 
host code is going to be executed on the host and then the kernel code depending on which kind of device you are requesting uh, will be executed so the runtime will uh, compile on the fly uh, this intermediate representation and will execute this code on the cpu on the gpu on the fpga based on uh, what you decide and that's basically how it works so there are some ways also to pre-compile the kernel if you want to do this kind of uh, optimization if you know that you are always using the same device but by default this is how it works and you also need to be careful at some point the way you are writing the code so um, for example you don't want to recreate a queue um, for every iteration because if you recreate a queue, then you recreate a new context and you will have to recompile this uh, kernel code for every iteration at some point. So you need to be careful how you write the code, but that's really just some syntax uh, optimization at some point, and that's really not uh, a big deal. So unified shared memory. So you've seen so far a few uh, features of SQL and that was actually mainly SQL because SQL is, is really the base of, um, of uh, DPC++ but we've seen that uh, to manage the memory uh, we have to create buffers you can also use something else called images um, I didn't explain that here uh, but that's kind of similar at some point then you need to create accessors so that's uh, powerful you have um, a lot of uh, expression um, and you, you have a lot of control uh, for the data dependencies but the problem is that you need to replace all your pointers to handle uh, two or three different pointers at some point for um, a given array because you have the array the buffer the accessor so it's a bit complicated and it has a lot of uh, sugar syntax and um, when we came with this uh, DPC++, uh, the idea was really to simplify it, um, to simplify it and to make it as close as possible as uh, some regular C++, uh, the way we are doing it on a single CPU, actually. So that's the reason why we, we came with this unified shared memory. So that's not part of SQL, uh, that's only part of DPC++ uh, for now. Uh, you just need to know that we are also working with uh, Kronos to push those uh, development into SQL standard. So basically there might be two, three different iterations uh, uh, or differences uh, between different iterations of SQL and DPC++, but uh, we are trying to push those modifications into the SQL standard too. So what it it requires is actually some support for unified virtual address space uh, to be able to use the same pointer on both sides so on the uh, host and on the device side and uh, basically we support with a unified shared memory three different allocation types so the first one is uh, what we call the device allocation type where basically you say okay i know that my data um, needs to stick on the GPU and I will not use those data uh, on, the, on the CPU, for example. So I don't want to have data going back and forth and, and not to control what is going on here. So I'm sure that I will always use this array from the GPU so I can allocate this directly on the device. So that's the first mode here. The second mode here is the host mode. So the data will be located on the host, but they will be accessible on the device. But what you need to understand here is that every time you are going to access it on the device, it will be accessed from the host. So there is some kind of um, cost for it. And then there is the shared mode. And the shared mode is basically a way to say uh, to the runtime, okay, I know that I will have to access my data on the host and on the GPU, on the device. So try to manage it the best way you can to give me uh, the best possible performance. And in that case, uh, the data will be able to uh, migrate from the host to the device and from the device to the host, so back and forth, basically. So if you are doing some explicit um, allocation, so like you are saying that the data will stick on the device, it's still possible actually to 
populate your data, to initialize your data, to put something in, in the data. But for that, you need to use um, so device allocation and memcopy. For uh, host and shared, this is implicit, so you don't need to do it. So here is an example with the um, device allocation. So how can we do that? So on the host, because here uh, we are still on the host, we specify that we want to do a malloc device. So we specify uh, the size. We need to also provide a queue to attach this uh, allocation to a given device. And then uh, once we are, um, when we want to basically populate uh, this array here, we need to use a memcopy and to send basically the data from the host to the device. Then we can, we need to call uh, wait actually uh, to do the synchronization. Then we can run the kernel, call wait again. And then we need to copy back the data. So that's how you manage the data when you do this malloc device. So if you don't want to do the synchronization and, and managing the data and the copy uh, by yourself, then you can use um, malloc shared or malloc host. And in that case, we have uh, basically the host array which is, by the way, accessible also on the device, but with uh, a bit more cost at some point. And then we have the shared array, uh, where we are using the malloc shared here. And then we have no synchronization to do in the first place. We just create the kernel, we create the parallel four, and then we do some stuff here, like uh, putting in shared array, host array plus one. And then we just need to call Q wait and then the data are back on the host and available here on the host. So that's basically basically how it works. Some uh, are really why you would use one. So if you are using explicit, uh, can that also require organization so that's a bit more complicated at some point one Cedric, I think we're having some audio issues. It keeps um, easy way cutting to out. To do it, but what we recommend, and that some point is filers like the allocation of uh, the buffers on the first line, then we do the buffer here. We modify. Hello, hello. It's still getting. I can try to actually uh, disable my VPN. Let me just try to do that. Uh, so that might disconnect me, but I will just connect back. Hello, hello. do you hear me? Yes, okay, perfect. So I'm just back uh, to the presentation. So th this was um, here. Let me just go back one slide. So that was the original version uh, with the buffers, uh, with the accessors. Uh, so we need to create the buffer, the accessor, then modify the accessor. And then um, we can go back once we close the scope of the buffer, we can go back to the original array. 
And now with unified shared memory, it's uh, a bit simpler as you just create uh, your allocation with, for example, malloc shared. Then you initialize the data on the host. You submit your kernel here. You're doing your stuff on the kernel using the regular pointer. Then you just need to call the qwait. And here you can still use uh, back the same pointer on the host side. And everything has been refreshed and, and, and you're ready to, to go. So that ends this presentation. I don't know if you have uh, questions. I hope that the audio didn't cut for too long. Okay, I then proceed. Thank you, Cedric, for your presentation. So, hello, everyone. My name is Anastasia Kazakova. I work for JetBrains as a C++ Tools Product Marketing Manager. And today I'm going to share with you a few findings we got about the C++ ecosystem in 2020. So, first of all, a few words from about the source of the data. So, we run a state of developer ecosystem survey for four years already in a row, starting in 2017. And this is an extensive research we do covering all the technologies. So, and actually like being a part of the technological landscape uh, here in JetBrains, we're very interested in what's going on there for many technologies, many languages. So just that we can align our tools development with them. So <clears throat> we do this survey for several years and we're really uh, doing our best to limit the bias there. So we do translate the survey into several languages. The idea behind is that there are several languages and countries in the world which uh, together gets us the 70% of all software developers in the world. So we do try to cover them all with our service and with all the translations. So uh, we don't have the fixed uh, time slot for the survey running. We usually start it somewhere late in January and then run until we get enough data. And that means that we do need to cover uh, the data from all these important countries that all together uh, just give us uh, 70% of the worldwide uh, software developers. So uh, we also do some waiting uh, because like there are full-time developers filling the survey, there are students. So we more or less know the distribution of students and full-time developers in each country. And so we try to wait the data to get the, uh, the proper um, the proper data all together so that the students, for example, in one country don't overweight the, uh, the the other data from other countries. So, and talking about the C++ also, we do validate the results against the C++ Foundation Light Survey. The Foundation also is running the survey for uh, several years in a row. And uh, as a, like, since we're uh, the official sponsors of the Foundation, we got the raw data and so that we can uh, validate our survey against the C++ Foundation one. And we also have some common questions which we exactly use for that purpose to validate the data. So this year, uh, we actually collected uh, quite many responses. It's about uh, 19,000s. Um, so that's in total for all the languages and all the technologies. So for C++, it's uh, a little bit less than 2000. So uh, it's very similar to what the C++ Foundation got this year as well. So most of uh, our developers are full-time C++ professional developers, like 42%, uh, but quite many students here as well. I would say that for C++, we got more students than for other languages. And you can see this chart with the years of experience that people get, uh, those who are filling this survey. So uh, there are those who are just starting with less one year uh, of their programming experience, those who are just doing one or two years, uh, three to five years, and there's then a part of those who are six and more years of programming experience. And if we compare with the C++ Foundation, I would say that the Foundation actually got um, they got more experienced developers usually fill in the survey and they're also a little bit biased to the English speaking countries and like uh, this bias is somehow is reflected in the results, but still the results are very similar. So in terms of the C++ role, most of the respondents fill in the C++ part are the actual developers. There are also some architects and team leads and also um, when looking at the data, we are trying to check the data, not in general, but also in three uh, main areas of the C++ development. So as we 
uh, extracted them several years ago when we were starting our C++ tools. The C++ now is mostly popular in embedded development, games development, and financial sector. So uh, here are some numbers of the respondents, the percent of the respondents uh, by these three sectors, and we're trying to look at the data by these three sectors to slice the data to check it uh, as well. So let's start with the most interesting thing here is the usage of the C++ standard in 2020. So C++20 is not yet signed, but it's like nearly ready, so you can start using it right away, uh, more or less. Some, not all the features are for sure for now supported in the compilers, but still you can find and check some interesting things. So, and we're really happy to see that uh, actually 12% of the respondents uh, selected the C++20 uh, as a standard they, they are allowed to use uh, at their work or their hobby project. So C++17 is actually 41%, which is also great because that means that the people are using one of the latest standards so far, actually the, the one official uh, latest standard for now. And you can see uh, still see quite many people on C++11. And this is the trend we saw previously. So I'm not comparing with the previous year on one chart. So just for you to briefly explain why, because previous years we obviously didn't um, get C++20 in the list and we also were treating C++03 and C++98 separately which is now joined into one uh, one option. So I'm just comparing the three previous year here on this chart and you can see how the how the situation actually goes. So you can see the C++17 is actually growing quite fast and that's really good and you can see this year that quite many people are on C++17 already. Uh, C++11 is still very popular so it's decreasing a bit but really 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 slowly and there are still a lot of people on the C++03 and C++98. Uh, if we check the uh, slices per these important areas I was talking before, uh, you can see that like this is the distribution for embedded finances and games. Um, I would say that it's interesting to see games moved to new standards a little bit faster, at least like quite many people from game development selected the C++17, which is actually interesting because in the game development you can't switch to a newer version of the standard unless the SDK providers uh, have switched as well because if you're doing a game for a console for like Nintendo Switch or for Xbox you definitely need your SDK to be compiled with the same um, language standard as you do your own code. So um, and like it's kind of expected to see the older standards used in the embedded it's um, Currently, I would say that it's a lot of embedded is done in pure C and the C++ is still of the very old standard there in use. Uh, here is the chats showing how the people are going to uh, migrate to a new standards in the next year. So we do ask them to select if they're going to migrate for each standard they actually checked previously. So actually the question about the C++ standard is multi-option so they can select several and then we ask if they plan to migrate in the next year for each option. You see that Quite many people do not plan to move to a new standard, like more than 40% for each group, and actually uh, like a half for those who are staying with C++03 and C++98. But it's good to see that quite many people are still planning to do so. And obviously, if you're on a high standard, it's easier for you to migrate. So uh, for those who are on C++40, and actually more than 45% are planning to migrate to C++17, which is actually quite good. and looks looks interesting. Um, so what is the important thing when you do migrate to a language standard is how you're going to check that you're not breaking things and there are two options for checking this. First is the unit testing obviously. Uh, so when you change something in your code you run the unit test uh, just to to be sure you're not breaking things. And it's interesting to see that still 34% of the respondents selected that they are not using any unit tests at all. So there are still 15% with uh, some probably in-house frameworks or some different approaches to unit testing. So they do use the unit testing, but without the uh, predefined framework. Uh, Google tests, uh, as before, they are dominating the area, but it's interesting to see cache growing significantly, like at 14% this year, which is actually a huge growth here. And the rest is just more or less uh, on the same level as previous years. 
Another approach to check the uh, stability of your code when you're changing things is the static analysis running uh, on the fly on your code or on a CI server in your editor or whatever. So you can see that 45% selected that they are not using any code analysis tools and the 46% actually told us that they are using the tool built in into their IDE. Uh, which makes us uh, feel the way that we're responsible for people's code quality because if we do integrate some tool into the editor, uh, into the ID, they would probably use it and if we don't, they would just go without it. So uh, most of the people are just selecting the tools built into their IDEs. And obviously Clank Tidy and Clank Analyzer are the two others most popular here. Uh, comment after the IDE is built-in tools. But it's still interesting to see how the these 35% not using anything are dealing with the changes and how they are checking the things. Uh, since we started talking about the tooling, obviously there is a chat showing the IDE distribution. It might be a bit biased uh, to check for instance tools, don't get me wrong here, because we are running the survey while we're trying to promote it independently through various organic and uh, paid channels. But still it's 22% coming to C-Line, and I would say that the data, at least the top three, is aligned uh, with what we see in C++ Foundation, so it's Visual Studio, C-Line, and Visual Studio Code. Um, like other tools here which are important is the compilers distribution. So there is the general distribution for uh, all the compilers and also the distribution common per area slices I've mentioned uh, before, like embedded finances and games. Definitely games uh, is the area for Windows development, so it's like 40, uh, 55 percent of Microsoft compiler because it's definitely a very Microsoft specific environment there for developing the games. And in the embedded, the GCC based compilers are definitely dominating. Uh, Again, about the tooling, the project model, like the top three for project models is staying the same for several years in a row. CMake actually went to the first place just maybe two or three years ago uh, by overcoming the Visual Studio project model and it's still growing, so it's more than a half respondent selecting CMake right now, so it's coming to something very similar, like very um, like ba ba basic project model used by the community. Uh, the last uh, tooling here is the dependency manager. So you see that the dependency manager story uh, in C++ ecosystem is hard enough. So we're like more than 30 years of the C++ existing and we still don't have a standard tool for managing the dependencies. And you see that nearly half of the respondents don't use anything. 23% are using the one provided by their system. And then comes the C package and con and growing every year. And it's a very interesting process to see if they manage to get uh, to the position of the official tools in the ecosystem. So that's mostly it from my side. So before I pass to Phil, just a few uh, notes, like we still gonna validate this data once again uh, against the C++ Foundation Lite 2020 results and the official infographics will be coming early June and also the raw data will, you, will be available so you can actually check and do your own slices if you're interested in any particular question uh, which you might solve with uh, our data. Um, so I probably will keep the questions and will answer them together with Phil in the end of our JetBrain session. So for now I will just share a few links so the presentation will be shared as well so you'll uh, get all these links and you can find the data from the foundation and from the developer ecosystem survey. And now I'm passing to Phil and uh, then we'll together with him answer uh, the questions if you have some. So hello everyone. Uh, I've got a couple of demos I wanted to run through just to switch gears a bit concentrate more on the code and the tools. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to dive right in. So this is C-Lion. That's our cross-platform IDE. So I'm, I'm running it here on my Mac, uh, but actually our most popular platform is now Windows. And of course, it also runs on Linux. So this is ideal for cross-platform development, although I also think it's ideal for single-platform development. But we'll see a little bit of cross-platform later, actually. Now, the, the project I've got open here is for Catch or Catch 2. So that's the, the test framework that uh, I wrote originally, although others are maintaining it now. As you heard from uh, Anastasia a moment ago in our ecosystem report, it's actually now the, the second most popular C++ test framework after Google Test. So quite pleased about that. Anyway, before we get to that code, I just wanted to focus on that word IDE that I mentioned. Now, we know that that stands for Integrated Development Environment. 
well, what does that really mean? Certainly that's like more than just an editor. Uh, it integrates tools as well. And traditionally that's been about uh, compiler, build system, debugger, and that's still true today, of course. But these days, as we've just been talking about, now development environments include so many more tools. We've got static analyzers, formatters, profilers, code coverage, even test runners. And we integrate all of those as well. And as Anastasia said, and that's really important because many developers just don't reach for those tools unless they're, they're bundled in the IDE. So we're, we're quite pleased to have all of those integrated. And that's all on top of our Code Insight features like uh, fast navigation, refactoring, code generation, that sort of thing. Now, all, all of this sounds really powerful and that's great, but surely that power must come at a lot of com uh, complexity. Uh, there must be a lot of uh, learning investment that needs to go into to mastering these things. And to some extent that's true, but I want to show the other side. That's what this demo um, is going to be about, this first demo. So when you do approach a new code base like this, or even an existing code base, one of the things you want to be able to do very easily is to find your way around the code base, to be able to find things easily. And of course, you know, we have a, uh, a find in path feature, which I think is best in class. Uh, but that's, you know, that's so year 2000. Well, we can do a lot better than that these days. So what I want to show you is a feature that we call search everywhere. And this has a really easy shortcut. There's no excuse not to remember it. You just press shift shift and that brings this up. That's just pressing the shift key twice. Gets you straight into search everywhere. Uh, what does it do? Well, if I type something like the word match, that uh, that brings up a lot of matches, if you pardon the pun. Uh, first of all, just recent files. So if you're moving about between a small set of files frequently, this could be really useful to quickly get back to one of those. But also matches in class names, other file names, and other symbols. And this is just like the high level summary. You see that the tabs along the top, we can dive in for a bit more detail. So if we look at symbols, you can see that there's a lot there that it's, it's matching pretty much instantly. This is a really fast way to find your way around the code base because it's indexed literally everything. So that's really powerful on its own and, and really cool. But let's go back here. As well as just matching on a, a linear sequence of characters, it's even better than that. So I want to find the, um, the catch exception uh, tr translation registry. You just type the initial letters of each of those words and catch is smart enough to find it. In this case, using a snake case convention, you can also do camel case as well. You notice actually on that third word there, translator, that R has matched the second letter of translator, not, not registry after all, just matches the first three letters, but it also matches letters within words even when it's splitting things up this way. So if I type these second letters, you can see so it's matching into each, doing separate matches into each word instantly. This is a really powerful, flexible way to, to find long file names at a large code base very quickly if you know the, that file name straight away. Not just file names, of course, symbol names as well. But let me just set up for my next demo. Going back to search everywhere. We didn't look at the, the actions tab. This is a little bit different. All the others are related to searching in, in textual items. Action searches, or well, actions, which is menu items, uh, shortcuts, that sort of thing. Things you can actually do. This gives the, the whole power of C-Line at your fingertips. Even if you don't know your way around, you can search for, let's just take the word find. If you type that in, it brings up every way that C-Line offers to find things instantly. Notice it also shows you all the shortcuts and menu paths. So it's a really great way to learn where these things are as well. And in fact, this is such an important feature that it has its own shortcut. It's called find, find Action. We can see it here. It actually tells us what the, the shortcut is for Find Action. So if I do Shift-Command-A on my Mac, it brings, uh, brings us straight back to there. So that's, that's a really quick way to, to learn your way around the system. Now, I'm gonna try something else. So if we wanna work out how to rename things, for example, that's a, a very popular refactoring or just refactor in general. All our refactorings are available here. 
I mean, that's a, a whole demo in its own right, but you can just explore that. Also, code generation. We just type generate. You see all the ways we can generate code, like destructors and destructors and lots of boilerplate code. That's a, a shortcut very well worth learning, the um, command N on my Mac, uh, to, to bring up the code generation menu. But I want to just show one of these actions, and that's format. So you can see here we've got format code. If I click that, then it actually goes and executes an action. So it's formatted this particular source file. You can see it says formatted 86 lines. You may have seen the code change a little bit. But what did it actually do? Well, we can do Command 9, again on my Mac, to bring up source code integration, sorry, source control integration. And you can see all of the changes that that formatting action has made. Uh, you can see down in the thumbnails down the side, that's quite a lot, those white space changes. Using version control is uh, often a, a useful way to see what, what the result of a particular action is, but may not be fine-grained enough. Sometimes you, you don't want to wait for uh, commits that you may do relatively infrequently. There's another feature that C-Line has that's going to help here. To set that up, I want to show you one of the refactorings first. So I said that probably still the most popular refactoring is rename, which is uh, Shift F6 on, on my Mac. So if I select a class name in this case, if I just start typing, you can see it updating all occurrences in that class name in this file in real time. When I hit return, it will rename them in other files as well if, if they're there. So that's a really nice quick way to do to do rename. Now, I could go back and look at the version control view to see what that actually did, or I can go to the VCS menu and we see something here called local history. If I do show history, that actually shows me something very similar to version control. You can see the uh, the diffs here, so that, that rename. Um, but we can also see other things. It's actually annotated in here, but I've used the rename. Uh, refactoring. Uh, we can see previous uh, attempts for me to of doing that as well when I was uh, refer rehearsing this. And in fact, even if we go back, we can see where I roll back using version control. So even version control actions are being recorded in this local history. And the best thing is, I didn't need to do anything to set it up or anything to maintain it. It's all fully automatic. Now, I wouldn't rely on this for storage. It's not version control. You know, think of it more like undo on steroids and you can get you know, diffs across the uh, whole regions as well. So it's a really fantastic feature and particularly works well if you're doing TDD where you often need those, those fine grain commits. So that's the, the end of that first demo. Um, hopefully uh, I've demonstrated that while it, to take full advantage of what C-Line has to offer, it does take a bit of an investment in time, but you can actually get uh, very productive instantly just using a couple of shortcuts, like shift, shift, and uh, command shift A. Uh, and the best thing is that that second one will actually teach you even more things that you can do uh, at the rate that you, you need them. So that was the first demo. I want to shift gears a little bit and go to another code sample. This one, a very simple um, example that uses get host name. So it's only work on POSIX machines to get the name of the, the host that it's running on and print it out. If I run that, you can see it just prints out, this is just the host name of the machine that I'm running on, as you would expect. Now, what I want to do with this is actually demonstrate two things, two for one bill. I want to show C-Line's remote debugging, the three remote development capabilities, which is actually quite a big subject in its own right. I did a, a one hour webinar last year just on that subject alone. Um, in fact, if you search for that, you'll you'll find it. So I want to demonstrate that. But also another thing we, we can do now is work with Docker containers. And we do that using those same remote development features. So why would you want to use Docker? Well, Docker, of course, is a lightweight um, container that works very much like a VM, but um, it is much faster and easier to use and lighter on, on the system. And it's ideal for things like uh, having parallel tool chain set up, you can choose between the container to uh, to compile and run your code. 
Um, or if you want to have just a, a quick reproducible environment, everyone has the same environment, it's great for that. Whatever you want to use it for, we can support it by using CLINE's remote development features. Now I've got a, a Docker file here that uh, was set up earlier. Uh, and in fact, this is available in a GitHub repo. If you search online for um, uh, CLINE Docker, uh, particularly if you look for videos, you'll find a, a fuller demo I did on this before, which has a link to this repo. Um, you don't have to understand Docker to, to be able to make use of this. Um, but you can see it's using a, a Ubuntu image, even though it's running on my Mac. It uses at get to set up a tool chain. So if you do want to make changes here, specific versions or a different compiler, uh, you can do that. Uh, then importantly, it sets up SSH because that's what CLINE's remote development feature uses. And then a user to, uh, to take advantage of that. So the best part about this is at the top in the comments, it actually has some command lines for building and running these Docker images. So say if you never used Docker before, once it's installed, you can just use this Docker file instantly. So if I take that first command and switch to CLINE's terminal, that's built in, I can execute that command. Oh. For some reason it's not letting me type into here. Obviously didn't pray to the demo gods this morning. Might need to uh, go back. Here we go, right. Okay, so that's built our image. That was instant because as you can see, it's um, using a cache of a version that I did earlier. Now, if you hadn't already got this set up, it would have to download that image and install those dependencies. That takes a couple of minutes, which is actually pretty good when you think what it's doing. Uh, but still, it would have made this demo a bit longer. So we used the cache version. So we built the image. The second command line runs that image. Uh, if, you, if you're looking at what this does exactly, that um, uh, this ptrace capability it's adding is important for debugging purposes, by the way. But that will run that image and expose uh, SSH on port 2222. And the number it returns is just the, the container ID. If I do Docker PS, that will show me running containers and we can see that's that same container ID. There's a friendly name. So we've got our Docker container up and running with those tools up and running in it as well. Now, how do we use that from CLINE? So if we come back to our example. We're going to settings and under build execution deployment, we have a tool chains uh, group under there where we can set up different parallel tool chains, one of which is remote host. Let's say at this point, this is identical to what you would use if you want to connect across the network um, to, to another machine, maybe running another operating system or into a VM. But here we're using it to go into to Docker. So I'm just going to call that Docker. And then we just need to set up the SSH credentials. Uh, a nice feature here is we can, we can actually see previous credentials that I've used and just go to them straight away. So here's one I already set up on localhost because it's all on the same machine. And there's that port 2222 that we set up in the Docker file, uh, or rather on the Docker command. And then username and password that's in the, uh, the, the Docker file as well. I'll test that connection. That was all successful. Then it will go away and probe in the container for the, the tool chain in the, uh, the standard locations. If you have them in different locations, you can set those as well. That will take a moment, so we're going to move on. And in order to use that tool chain, we just need a CMake profile for it. So I'll make this one a debug. We use the Docker tool chain, and that's it. Now that's ready to use. So when we come out, it's got to then just copy all of those files, sync all the files, including dependencies, over to the, to the Docker container, which uh, takes a moment here. If you've got a big project, it may take a bit longer the first time. Um, that is one area that we, uh, we could do better on um, by allowing um, mapped volumes, which means that an area within the Docker container is mapped to a, uh, a directory on your local uh, host machine. Um, and that would avoid that step. So that, that's something we'll be looking at in the future. For now, this works and it's usually pretty good. So that's all in the container. If I now select that CMake profile and, and run that, 
now we can see that the host name that's reported back is the first part of our Docker our container ID. If I show you the, uh, there, 4250, that was the same one. So obviously you can set a host name in Docker, but this just demonstrates that it's it was building and running uh, our example code in the Docker container using the tool chain that we installed there, uh, all within just a few minutes. So that was two ends of the spectrum of things that you can do with C-Line. Obviously, there's a lot, uh, a lot of other things that uh, that I've glossed over or, or missed. But I think we're out of time for for my demo. So maybe we'll see if there's any questions. There was actually a question um, regarding the CMake tests and better integration. I think the C test was meant by that, so I can try and share some information. So actually, last okay. week during our C line related webinar, we were exactly showing this thing how to use C test inside C line. It's a bit not uh, really automated because, like C test, is something very similar to our own building um, test runner which we provide inside C-Line and which works perfectly with Google Test, Catch or Boost Test. Like C-Test is kind of uh, very similar to that, so it's not that easy to match it fully to our building test runner, but you can actually run the C-Tests and like select different tests and uh, run them as a run configuration. So uh, I think that we'll publish the recording from the last week webinar in the upcoming days and you can find uh, how to use the C-test inside C-Line inside this demo and we'll probably make a separate blog post on the topic because I see some very uh, big interest uh, for the topic. So that's what I can say right now about the C-test. Thank you. I think there was one other question as well about uh, if there's any plans to provide a, a web-based version of C-Line. Uh, certainly no plans for C-Line itself. Um, there may be other things going on in the, in the company that we, we often have R&D projects um, in that space, but nothing that we can talk about at this point, I think. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome to this C++ in 2020 webinar. My name is Mary Kelly, and we have Chris Gardner um, as well joining me today. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about some of the trends, challenges, and what we've been learning uh, at Whole Tomato. Next slide. So on to some of the trends we've been seeing with Visual Assist customers. Next slide. We're finding that a lot more people are actually writing code. It's almost becoming a necessity to careers today and it's becoming ingrained into our daily life. We have real world problems that are being solved with software, and today it is currently the best and primary way to tackle many of these problems. We've been seeing an uptick in the trend for use of computer science and degrees in computer science since about 2009, uh, mostly growing a bit more rapidly due to the accessibility on learning and social platforms. And it's also a lot easier to do more because of the availability of the APIs and SDKs to build off of. And we've gotten to the point where we've reached a sort of critical mass where we have so many experts around to transfer knowledge to people and ways for people to learn. And in a lot of cases, you can do a quick Google search and find the answer. So it's a bit easier now to teach yourself to code. Next slide. More multi-language development. There's a lot more in terms of multi-language development going on right now, more than ever. Good luck, you know, writing a GUI in C++ alone. It's a very improbable task. Most of the newer or more popular languages are packed with more higher level features that are faster, definitely safer, and in many cases, easier to learn and provide productivity tools and software for. You can create a program in C++, take your lower level code and expose that C++ API to some simpler language, like what TensorFlow has done with machine learning. 
And with all the options available, you now have choices in what language is going to be the best for your program. So you'll use C++ where you know it excels and you'll avoid it when you know it won't work. Next slide. A lot of our customers have code bases that are just ballooning in both complexity and the number of lines of code. And a big reason for this is due to the fact that software makes money. You know, take the gaming industry, for instance. Um, one game can make a company, and there's so much money to be made in that development alone with the hundred of, hundreds of developers that are integrated. Some teams are even adding gigantic amounts of code in the editor all at once to check for breaking when they make changes to major functions, especially if they're developing for the API like the engine. We're seeing a greater use of larger APIs like the Unreal Engine, Unity, as the functionality expands and even more solo and indie developers are becoming familiar with this challenge as well. Using these engines takes its toll and can push both Visual Studio and Visual Assist to the max because of how large the APIs really are. So it's no longer just these large fortune companies that are seeing this, but even smaller teams that are using the code available. Next slide. Some of the challenges these trends present to Visual Assist and our developers. Next slide. The complexity of C++ is really increasing, uh, skyrocketing even. New users are facing a huge battle to learn C++. It's just a huge language with so many monstrous things that it can really derail some users due to the complexity. And despite you know, the many faults of C++, it's still gaining in popularity. It's one of the most popular languages in the world, now getting major additions and updates to the language every three years since C++ 11 in 2011. Backwards, compatib excuse me, backwards compatibility is really a necessity in C++. And this is something that we have to support here with Visual Assist as well. And the knowledge transfer to C++ is really much more difficult than moving from C++. You can know other object-oriented programming languages and still have difficulty learning C++ between understanding memory management and figuring out all of the little quirks that C++ has. It can be a bit of a hassle. Next slide. The need to be multilingual in programming languages. It's a bit of the law of the hammer, where you only have a hammer, where if you only have a hammer, then everything else looks like a nail. But in nowadays, not all software looks like a nail, and it's becoming a lot harder to realize or create software projects in just one language. And to go off of that, you know, in some cases, C++ isn't necessarily the best tool for the job anymore. And developers are becoming more fluent in more than just one programming languages. You have younger software developers who are expected to proficiently know anywhere between three and five. And so we're seeing a lot more developers who are really being forced to kind of take that dip into C++, which can be pretty surprising to us at least, to say the least. In more cases, these developers are just taking that dip into C++ just because of the projects and that are requiring this greater mix of languages. And when they finally take that plunge, the expectations that they have or that they want out of modern programming languages are really being shattered and they don't have great tools available and are really having a hard time and having to spend more time 
learning and understanding C++ before they can make the first step towards tackling these projects. Next slide. Understanding C++ is very hard. And there's no doubt about that. Programmatically understanding C++ is even harder. And then trying to programmatically understand non-C++ extensions is just about impossible. And because of these reasons, there are very few useful productivity tools for C++. And in some cases, they can come with several drawbacks. They can add user interface noise, over, lower overall performance, and add on additional memory usage. Next slide. So what is Visual Assist? Next slide. Well, Visual Assist is a productivity plugin for Visual Studio for C++ development. We currently support Visual Studio versions 2005 through the current 2019 edition. And VA really fills in the gaps in your coding experience of Visual Studio. So it's expanding a great IDE by providing you know, unmatched functionality in a lot of cases for things like navigation, refactoring, code generation and understanding, and a lot more. Next slide. Our focus is really to provide C++ developers with useful tools to enhance their coding experience in Visual Studio. We don't want to get in their way. There's already so much noise and so many features that have been built into the IDE that developers really don't need it. And Visual Assist is a very understated product to the point that it's barely visible. Just a few shortcuts that allow you to use features intuitively so you can keep on coding. And of course, performance. And this is really our bread and butter. Um, at Whole Tomato, this is our sole product. Visual Assist is we specialize in performance and productivity for C++ developers. There's no extra noise, no flashy icons, just progress. Next slide. Now I'll go ahead and pass the mic over to Chris for what we're doing at Whole Tomato. All right, uh, hi everyone, my name's Chris. Uh, kind of have to keep in mind that it's not uh, 5 a.m. for you guys over there. <laughs> this for us. <clears throat> Waking up a bit. So what are we doing? Uh, and what can other tool developers or just developers in general, software developers, uh, what can you learn from our approach? So one thing that we've, we've done uh, a lot more recently that we probably should have been doing more is we're working directly with our customers, um, our larger customers especially. Uh, because private code bases make progress difficult for a tool developer. You really need to have, you need to know what your tool is being used on and they can't just share it with you uh, because that will, they're, they're just not gonna do that generally. <laughs> you know, they a large company like uh, Unreal doesn't wanna give you the source code to its um, money-making game, right? Fortnite or you know EA doesn't necessarily wanna really, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's the essential, it's the essential problem is the same. And so uh, you need to basically speak with them and have a strong connection with them so that you can get information and the feedback and the developers know that, hey, there's someone on the other end that's really trying to listen to us. Uh, and we've solved a lot of problems like that and found a lot of ways that our product is being tested that we didn't expect. And that's line two. Learn where your product is being tested in ways you didn't expect. And we learned quite a lot. And we learned that uh, <laughs> it was being tested in ways that we didn't, we couldn't have dreamed of, much less have expected. <laughs> Another thing that we've learned is product statistics don't really tell the whole story. Uh, there is so much, it's, it's hard to know what someone is really trying to use your product for if you just put in statistics on how many times they use this feature or whatnot. And we don't even do any of that. We, we, we thought about it for a while and we decided not to and we, we decided against it because that's not how uh, we wanted to 
to collect. There was a privacy issue too, but that just wasn't that just wasn't what we were interested in. We wanted to talk to the developers because they always have more to tell us because they can tell us why they're not using a feature and what they do use. Um, and something else that's really important that we've done a lot recently is allow developers ac allow users access to your developers. It's important to be picky because there's a lot of people out there that are just a professional waste of time. <laughs> but uh, but there are some people uh, and there are customers out there that are that are willing to work with you and and show you where your product has has if if your product has faults or where it works well or where it could could become better. And it's very important to listen to those people. So be picky, but you shouldn't firewall uh, people off completely. Because if you if you can't have a tech person talk with a tech person, uh, having the middleman can muddy the translation. Um, and we talk a lot about larger companies, but a single indie developer can a lot of not a lot of times, but surprising amount of time can teach you more if you're just willing to listen to them. So you you really need to listen to both large and small voices. And uh, lastly, large customers might reach out to you first. Uh, that's 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 what happened with us in in a few cases, uh, especially with uh, Unreal. Um, and that was kind of a mistake on our end. We really should have reached out to them first. We had no idea that it was being used as much as it was um, among their developers. Because a lot of times developers will buy personal licenses. And then so we won't have any way to track. We don't know where they work. So we can't say, oh, well, all this company is using the product. Um, but don't count on that. You really, you really should should reach out. If you if you can if you if you can find the sense that they're using your product, and we didn't really know, so we can be somewhat excused. And another thing that's really important is reducing memory usage. And that's really especially important for us because we're a plugin in Visual Studio and there's a shared memory environment. <clears throat> we do some operations out of process, but we do share memory with Visual Studio. And it's very limited. So, uh, and it uses more memory every year. 2019 is a significant jump. There was a lot of features in the beta for um, Visual Studio 2019 that are disabled by default simply because it would cause the IDE to just crash because it ran out of memory. That's with no plugins installed, right? So it, it loves its memory and it loves to crash. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, it instantly crashes when its memory is exhausted. It's programmed, it is designed to do that. That's how Microsoft writes software. Um, and developers often have several heavy plugins installed. Uh, there are developers out there that use Visual Assist and they use JetBrains products on top of that. And they use Incredibuild and they use uh, you know, custom in-house plugins. And you know, they've got all these things to try and help them out. But of course that costs memory as well. So so you don't wanna you don't wanna uh, use a lot of memory when everyone else is, you know, you've only got a couple hundred megabytes left. <laughs> on top of the stack before you know that's the difference between crashing and not crashing you start as a productivity tool the last thing you want to do is crash someone's software um and development machines are already heavily taxed even not even not just specific to the memory space of a 32-bit process but just in general and that is just the cost of large tools like the unreal engine you know you're you're being taxed on the on the cpu your gpu your ram even your hard drive space is getting taxed so it's important to be as light and fast as possible. And just something that's simple, and we all know as developers by now, I'm sure, is less memory often means a faster runtime. CPU fast, memory access slow. Uh, sometimes something simple as dynamic compression can speed your uh, program up because now you have to access less memory, uh, even though your CPU has to do a ton more work because it can do it very easily. Another thing I wanted to talk about is how we've targeted specific APIs. And this is more of a tools developer kind of uh, point. Um, many APIs have non-C++ have non extensions that we must understand. As complex and difficult and feature rich in a sense as C++ is, a lot of people say that's not enough. And so they extend it with, uh, with features uh, that, and they, they create a precompiler to make things even easier in theory for their developers. So they can write some macro out and then the precompiler sees it and generates actual C++ code that goes in before the actual compile happens. And Unreal Engine and Qt are pretty good examples of this. Unreal Engine has a very complex uh, precompiler, uh, whereas Qt has a somewhat simpler one, but those are, those are popular and they, they definitely do that quite a bit. 
Uh, so it's it's very important to do that if you're going to understand uh, the language. And it's so important actually that with Unreal Engine, if you've ever used the Unreal Engine just without any plugins or whatever, without JetBrains or without Visual Assist, and you'll notice that IntelliSense can't understand just about any of it. It's gonna it's gonna underline almost every piece of code read. It doesn't get anything. It doesn't understand. It's not able to parse it whatsoever. And part of the reason is a big part of the reason is just because of those uh, those macros. It just doesn't understand. Uh, so it's important to understand the needs of API developers as well. Not just the developers using the API. Uh, so for example, um, we thought that we had really understood what our product could be pushed to when we started talking to Unreal Engine developers and uh, other developers working in these large code bases. We thought, wow, this is, this is as pushed as it's going to get. But then when we started uh, you know, getting lines into the companies themselves, we realized that what they were doing is they would put all of their products into one solution. Uh, all of their products, all of their games, uh, their engines, their tools, everything. And the, the theory behind it is, well, it makes it a little easier. You can just, if you need to find or go somewhere, you don't have to open another solution or project. But that's just, <laughs> to a tools developer, to Visual Studio, and to Microsoft itself, that just, it's, it's nuts. Um, <laughs> They recently, imagine this, the Unreal Engine is such a huge thing that recently uh, in the newest version of the engine, they reorganized their include slightly at the advice of uh, Visual Studio and Microsoft, and they were able to decrease their memory usage by 500 megabytes just by rearranging their includes, which is just that's how big these code bases are. <laughs> and that's how much memory Visual Studio is using. You, there's you're very little off the top, that's what you get. Um, right, and it, you need to use the tools they use. If you're gonna provide useful features, you need to, you need to, you need to understand it. You need to understand it at an almost fluent level. Uh, you, can't, you can't bring a, a, a feature to an Unreal Engine developer or a Qt developer or, or you know, a Unity developer if you don't understand what, the, the, what they're working in. You just you just can't, and you can try, and you can you can put features on the table, but they just won't be useful. Um, let's go ahead and move on. So, in looking into the future, Project X, uh, always innovate. It's important to always be thinking ahead and trying to do what I said with innovation and just focusing on uh, how developers work. If you're a tool developer, or if you're a software developer, how your users uh, are. Are, are using your product and what what could bring what could take the next step uh, for your product and for your users. Uh, it, it's important to make it useful though. You, you shouldn't throw things at the wall necessarily because of there's noise and, and there's cost to that, of course. And don't dismiss big ideas. It's it's very easy to dismiss big ideas as being well. Let's we've got other things to worry about and we'll put it on the back burner. But the back burner never comes sometimes, and it's important to, to take a look at what you can really do and what, what's really actually possible. And sometimes you'll find that there's an easier way to do something that you didn't think you could do before. C++ 20, right around the corner. Uh, it's not, not much longer. We have to wait before implementing, before modules and such are all fully implemented in all of our compilers. So for us, that's a big deal because we have to support that, and we've gotten ahead of that somewhat. And 2020 is just going to be a, a big year for Visual Assist. We have a lot planned, and we're really, really excited. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> so a quick and dirty uh, on code inspection and a few other tools. I just we we don't have much demo up for you today. I just want to do a very, very quick demo that shows one of our features, something that I think is relevant to this talk. And it's a uh, it's a feature that helps. It's a static analyzer that runs as you type which is, I guess, a bit of a misnomer on static analyzer. But many of the features it uh, it comes with, well, many of the, so basically it, it analyzes your code as you type, and if it finds something that it can improve, it puts a little blue underline under it. And if you click a tomato, it can tell you, oh, well, you should probably use equals default here. And you can click it, and it'll rewrite your code for you. That's really nice. A lot of our developers don't even know about it yet because it's technically in beta but it's been in beta for a while. And it's actually a really great tool that we've put a ton of work into. And I'm gonna have to ask my manager why it's in beta still, because I can't be, I'm not sure to be honest. But you should turn this on and give it a run and, and check it out because it's great. Um, here's something very simple too. Uh, make sh a, a shared pointer, just use make shared. 
unique pointer. Oh, we'll use unique pointer. You know, a lot of people, they might not even know raw string literals exist. Well, it makes this a little easier. Uh, yeah, I could just jump through this really quickly. It understands a lot of things. Uh, convert to using declaration. It's a great way to modernize your code. So if you have a code base that's written in an older dialect, essentially, of C++, that's not taking advantage of some of the newer and safer ways you can do things in the newer releases of C++, this is a great tool to do that. And it, it support, and, and it's great that it rewrites it for you. You know, if you've ever done the old swap trick to, to clear out the memory of a vector and you didn't know shrink to fit exists, well, there it is. And I like how it can rewrite even seemingly complex stuff. So it can turn this for loop into a for each loop. And even further, it could say, well, that should be a const reference. And something I like a lot, I'm gonna undo all these changes. Oops, did too much, so building this. You can uh, look at this code results window and you can apply all the quick fixes at once. So it can fix an entire file for you at once. And this is a really useful feature. Um, I love it a lot, I've, I've used it myself. Uh, we used it on our product when, when, we, when we were developing it and found that you make a, it, it, it's easy to make a lot of mistakes. It's easy to maybe forget that null pointer exists for a moment because you've been writing null so many times in your life. Or you might try the copy and swap trick. It, it, there's just so many things that are built into it and it's got a long list of checkers. And you can see the list of checkers by jumping into the options dialog. It's off to the side here. And jumping into code inspection. And here's a list of what we do and the level that it's going to show at and a list of uh, configuration options for each one. And that's a very useful feature, I think. And it's, it's great to modernize code. And when C++ 20 becomes popular, we'll have features in there to help bring your code up to C++ 20 as well. So that's, uh, that's our quick and dirty demo. Thank you. Stay safe. Mary Kelly, back to you. All right, thank you, Chris, for that demonstration. Uh, I guess if anyone has any questions, we'd love for you to add them into the questions panel in GoToWebinar. All right, it does not look like we have any questions at this time, so I guess we can pass the mic back to Gray Matter. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for uh, attending our webinar. Uh, we really hope you found it useful. Um, and thank you massively to the speakers that have taken the time out to present today. Uh, much appreciated. If there are any final questions for any of the speakers, whether it be, be for Cedric, for Intel, or for Anastasia and Phil, for JetBrains, or again for Mary and Chris, um, please do pop them in the chat bar or into the questions bar. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if you would like to contact us for any more information about what was presented today, if you'd like more resources or anything like that, we will be sending out a follow-up email with copies of the slides and uh, further details, as well as the recording for you to refer to and also share with other colleagues. Um, I'll just double check, is there any questions there? Can anyone see any of the other presenters? Can't see there. Um, don't think there is any. Um, so at that, I'm just going to leave it there and say uh, again a massive thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Keep safe, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>